Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the monthly chart of First Majestic Silver. I have it crossed over the Dow Transports Average. I like to use the Dow Transports Average because it's, in my mind, a more accurate assessment of where the economy is, the state of the economy. But also, it's although it is manipulated, it's less likely to be manipulated as the Dow 30 industrials because that is as Andy Hoffman puts, the Dow propaganda average. That's the one that politicians uh, want to show uh, new highs or they want it propped up because that's the one that everyone looks at. So you can see here, there's a couple of things. What I'm trying to point out is that it doesn't look at all like what it did back in 2008. You can see the Dow topped actually had a top in this stock price first and then the Dow topped and you can see they went down together. Now this is as I pointed out last time Jeff Nielsen of Bullion Bulls Canada has predicted that we're going to see something like we saw in 2008 which was a situation where the markets all went down together. Now if we look at this chart this does not appear to be what we saw in 2008. It actually looks more like this chart if we kind of concentrate into this area here where you can see that the Dow was rising and then First Majestic just absolutely blew through it, took off. So this area here is uh, a correction of the paper assets for um, companies compared to admittedly paper assets for a mining company but you can see they're coming very very close what's going to happen well another thing to look at is that if you look at the correction point that we had back in here kind of in the middle of this gigantic rally we did have this big red candlestick here now for this one that we're looking at to be a red candlestick it's actually going to have to close below the high on this blue candlestick which it could and uh, so this could be a pause in the rise uh, and there's no question in my mind that we could see new highs in stocks the fed the bis the treasury they're in control of the markets and the question is are they going to let them go we're going to see that when we listen to the uh, jeff berwick video talking about Jim Rogers and his most recent prediction. Now, a lot of people have talked about this cryptocurrency LISC, and so I wanted to show you this because this is a really good example. People had been asking me about this, and I really don't have time to cover all the cryptocurrencies and the new cryptocurrencies, and I don't even know if these figures are accurate. I'm, I'm really surprised that the uh, market cap is at 21 million. I think maybe this figure hasn't been updated. Uh, perhaps. But if you look at the price action in this cryptocurrency, I did the math here. I took the high. The high was about 7.8, 7.9. The low here is 0.18. We're talking about a 98% drop in the price of this cryptocurrency. So you can see the volume that came in. It just resulted in massive selling. And that's the kind of thing that that you see in these. So my advice initially was that yes, you can buy it on the initial run up, but you better be very nimble to sell into whatever top is there. And that's hard to get, hard to pick. So congratulations to anybody that sold at eight, but we've now gone down 98%. So now is the time. If you believe in this cryptocurrency, if you believe it's going to be whatever the, and I haven't researched it. Uh, there's just too many coins out there to research but if you believe this one is going to offer something new to the space if it's a unique idea and something that you think is going to have uh, a long life then now is the time to start watching it and possibly begin to accumulate it. I may go and buy some myself considering this down 98 percent. Um, now as Jesse Livermore said very famously in his book that I often quote, uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, he said that uh, when you're talking about when the market's dead, when, you, when the 
the bodies are dead. He's talking about stocks, but when you have these dead bodies, dead stocks, um, they float to the bottom, and it takes a long time for them to actually float up. So when something crashes, it can can make a very, very long bottom. So probably if you're interested in the coin, now is not the time uh, to accumulate a lot. You might want to buy a little bit and then wait and see if it goes lower. And then if you believe in it, maybe buy a little bit more. But those dead bodies can take a long time to rise once they've uh, crashed. So you have to be very careful with these cryptocurrencies. And, and this is a perfect example, down 98%. So let's listen to the video here. This is Jeff Berwick covering this most recent revelation from Jimmy Rogers. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of torn with Jeff Berwick because I, I was a little bit disturbed when he came out with the Shemitah thing. First of all, Jeff Berwick is admittedly not a Christian. So it, it was kind of surprising to me to see him latch onto the Shemitah thing. And uh, the, the man who's behind it is Jonathan Kahn. Uh, he wrote The Harbinger and another book. And, you, and there's some really some amazing information in that book, especially about 911. I encourage everybody to, to investigate that. But you have to be very, very careful. I've covered before the fact that when you're talking about Christianity and cults that arise in Christianity, the one of the largest causes of cults to arise is failed predictions. And you would think that that would be the end of them, but that's not how it works. The way that it works is that when people make a specific dated prediction about anything, uh, then they're faced with a choice if it doesn't come about in the timeline that they've predicted. They either have to just come right out and say, I was wrong, the timing was incorrect, uh, I did that when I made my prediction for $100 silver. I was wrong. Now, Jeff Berwick is getting to the point here where he's either going to have to admit he was wrong or he's going to double down, and it kind of seems to me like he wants to double down on this thing. Certainly, in my opinion, if we see stocks go into new highs, then there's no question in my mind that this Shemitah prediction is wrong. Now, could it come true ultimately? Yes. And uh, those of us who stack silver, who are still stacking silver, and a lot of us aren't stacking anymore, but those of us who are stacking silver, uh, we definitely have been proven wrong so far. And uh, if, if the scenario that we expect comes, comes to fruition, we ultimately will be proven correct. But as, as it is so far, we haven't been. And we have to be very, very careful to try uh, to avoid committing ourselves to dates. Because what happens is if you commit yourself to a date and things don't pan out exactly the way you predicted, you can start to be begin to mold the facts to fit the scenario. And I'm kind of worried about Jeff Berwick that that's what he's starting to do. But let's watch this video. It's interesting that we have this biblical reference, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delve into that after we watch the video, so let's take a look at this. Last year, we were the first financial site to explain how the Shemitah seven-year cycle would have an important and disastrous effect on the markets. The Shemitah ended in the third quarter of last year, and just as we predicted, it was the worst quarter in worldwide stock markets since the last Shemitah in 2008. Since then, we've been the leader in explaining further Shemitah trends embedded in the once every 49 year Jubilee year. The Jubilee year ends on October 2nd of this year, and we expect even worse events to occur as October approaches. But now, famous investor Jim Rogers has just released a new warning saying the same. He's even using biblical references to warn of a financial tsunami that could take place either this year or next. He has just said, a $68 trillion biblical collapse 
is poised to wipe out millions of Americans. Rogers co-founded the Quantum Fund with George Soros in the early 1970s. The fund generated returns of 4,200% over 10 years and made fortunes for both men. Soros and Rogers, having worked together for so long, probably both have access to information the regular person doesn't. Soros recently was in the news for shorting the stock market and making gold his largest held asset and predicting an impending crisis. Now, just this week, Jim Rogers has said the same and was quite outspoken about how it was written in the Bible. He referred to a quote from the book of Joshua. You are under a curse now. You will always be servants. You will be woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. The amount of people joining the bandwagon predicting imminent collapse of a biblical proportion is getting nearly lopsided, especially considering that it was less than a year ago that we were one of the only people talking about it. Carl Icahn, Stanley Druckenmiller, and Soros himself to name a few. Each of these individuals has now placed significant funds in gold and gold-related securities. Soros has gone so far as to actively short the stock market. Their messages are similar to Rogers, who sees economic turmoil descending that will actually bankrupt whole nations. Rogers believes the situation is much worse than 2008, when major economies had dollar resources in reserve. Those countries like China and Japan have spent down much of their reserves. Thus, it won't just be the US or Europe that suffers from the next wave of market insolvency. This time, the entire world is going to be relatively helpless. There are not going to be patches of prosperity like in 2008. He predicts that the UK will collapse while countries like Italy will face bankruptcy. He's pointed out that stock market breadth began to contract in the middle of 2014 and hasn't ceased. This calls for the only remedy that Wall Street knows, additional money printing. But right now the Fed is trying to move in the opposite direction toward tightening. What central bank officials see as recovery, however, is merely the result of artificial money printing and debt expansion. The looming disaster that is about to hit is imminent because in the US, recoveries don't last more than seven years at the outside. Roger's perception that the upcoming catastrophe has a historical or biblical element remind us of statements by a top executive for the International Bank for Settlements, William White. We quoted him here as follows. The only question is whether we are able to look reality in the eye and face what is coming in an orderly fashion or whether it will be disorderly. Debt jubilees have been going on for 5,000 years, as far back as the Sumerians. The next task awaiting the global authorities is how to manage debt write-offs and therefore a massive reordering of winners and losers in society without setting off a political storm. Rogers has stated that $68 trillion could be wiped off the earth and millions of Americans as well. It could actually be worse than that. This is the end of the monetary system as we know it and will result in life as we know it changing forever. And it's all been planned. If you haven't seen our video exposing the elite Jubilee plan to completely reorder the world, perhaps as soon as this coming October, you should see it immediately. You can see it at SurviveShemitah.com. There is probably not much more time to prepare. Given what is now being predicted by billionaires and investment gurus alike, if you aren't prepared now or soon, it may be too late. We've already made massive gains by seeing things ahead of the crowd and will likely make even bigger ones in the future. But the key will not be just what to buy, but how, when, and where. Surviving a biblical collapse is not going to be easy for anyone. There is no roadmap for something like this. But we've been ahead of the curve in figuring out what is coming and we've been ahead of the curve in coming up with innovative ideas, information and solutions to help you protect yourself and your family. You can get access to all of our resources, information and advice by subscribing to the Dollar Vigilante newsletter at dollarvigilante.com. So that's the video now let me correct one thing here i do not believe that the performance of quantum fund which accurately described was 4200 percent a 42 fold gain over the course of 10 years now if you read the market wizards interview with jim rogers uh, you'll see the reasoning and the description of the trades that that rogers executed uh, actually, Soros executed at the behest of Rogers. Rogers was the one making decisions, 
and you can see his logic and reasoning. He gives the reasons why he invested in what he invested in, and it didn't have anything to do with inside information. I don't believe that Jimmy Rogers trades on inside information. I believe that he trades on fundamental information, and he will. he's the first one to say he's the worst market timer in the world, but he looks for things that are undervalued to buy, and he looks for things that are overvalued to short. That's what he does. Now, Soros, on the other hand, uh, he is known for shorting and breaking the British pound. I personally believe that was probably based on the inside information, and we've seen what Soros has done uh, since then. Um, Soros is really, honestly, a despicable person, and his involvement in politics is, uh, I can't even describe the things he's done. So I don't see the two in the same light at all. But uh, back to the, the main topic here, this this idea of the Shemitah. Now, it's interesting that he's talking about Sor uh, I'm sorry, Rogers quoting this biblical reference. And this is kind of interesting. If you're not familiar with that biblical reference that he's talking about, it comes from the book of Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 9. If you're not familiar with the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites were a tribe who were in the promised land that Israel had been told by God to take militarily. And uh, they had had a string of successes. Uh, there was the uh, failure when, uh, I believe it was AI, uh, but they, they had, there was a sin in the camp when someone took uh, from, the, from the treasures of Jericho, Babylonish, uh, it was called the sin of Achan. But uh, other than that, they had a string of successes. And then we have this story, the Gibeonites, who basically tricked Joshua. What they did was they uh, took wineskins and, and food and bread and made it look like they had taken a very, very long journey. And then they came and made peace. Uh, with Israel and they vowed a vow that they would not destroy them and they made an alliance with them. Now probably the most important verse that we have here is uh, when it's explained here uh, right here in, in verse 13 and these bottles of wine which were filled were new and behold they be rent and these are garments and our shoes have become old by reason of the very long journey and the men took of their victuals and asked not of the counsel, asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. So this is actually the only instance that you can find in the Bible for uh, failure of Joshua. Now, there are a lot of famous men in the Bible who have various levels of sin. We know that Noah got drunk after the ark had landed. We know that David uh, committed adultery and murder. But Joshua is someone that we know that Moses struck the rock, was not allowed in the promised land. But Joshua was someone who was in every way perfect except this instance. And it's very informative because they made this alliance with the Gibeonites. Now, it turned out the Gibeonites were very, very close to where they were. So as soon as they came to their city, they found that they'd been deceived, but they had sworn an oath. But the main point here is they asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. So what does that mean? I, I don't really know. I can't tell you what it means that Jimmy Rogers would cite this. Uh, I hope Jimmy Rogers is reading the Bible and thinking about uh, becoming a Christian. I, as far as I know, he's not. Uh, I hope the same thing for Jeff Berwick, who is uh, not a Christian but seems to be drawn to it. So back to the chart. I don't believe that this chart indicates that we are in a similar situation as we were in 2008. I don't know what the situation is that we're in. Silver has corrected significantly. We're back to about 1625. Uh, we've corrected quite a bit. Uh, if we look at the MACD on this chart, it's similar to the MACD on uh, silver. We've got a, on the daily, we've got a fairly top formation here um, but on the long-term monthly we still have that rising pattern uh, just barely getting to that zero line 
So the big question is going to be, are we going to have a repeat and everything turned down like we did in 2008? Or are we going to get a uh, sort of hyperinflationary upside move? And uh, I, I kind of tend towards the latter just because uh, I think that this, uh, I'm going to watch Jeff Burrick very carefully now because there isn't much time left for this Shemitah thing to come to pass. Um, we know when people set dates, they kind of push them back. I think, what was the date now? By October. We'll see if we stand by that. Um, it's going to be very interesting, but we will be tracking that very carefully to see uh how it turns out and uh, if people decide to reverse themselves and we'll talk to you next time.